ancients were known for their longevity. In ancient times, Methuselah was known for having lived a long life. Ancient records, secular and religious, indicate that the antediluvian kings and patriarchs lived exceptionally long lives. It is hard not to concede that these claims have some truth, even if they are exaggerated. The modern man is beginning to take these claims seriously since he is exploring the possibility that aging can be controlled, even reversed, and that lifespans can be logically extended. Scientists currently study the concept of purely genetic control of aging and reducing environmental stresses on the human body. There may be multiple causes of aging, as scientists now believe that the mechanisms involved are highly complex and variable. There are two general categories of theories of aging, error theories and programming theories. The error theory proposes that random events, such as environmental assaults, damage the body's cells. Cells, molecules and organs malfunction due to this accumulated damage over time. In programming theories, aging is assumed to be programmed into the genome and is the result of a purposeful sequence of events. At the molecular level, the wear and tear theory state that DNA is continuously damaged, but the body cannot repair the damage, resulting in molecular and organ malfunction. Metabolic theory suggests that the faster organisms live, the quicker they die. Animals' aging rates are altered only by caloric restrictions, while nutrition affects certain hormones controlling metabolism. According to the free radical theory, Free radicals are volatile chemical fragments released during normal metabolism that react with other molecules to cause damage. Age-related damage caused by free radicals may interfere with critical cell functions. Therefore, according to the error theory, the body will produce faulty chemicals and proteins which will be synthesized and accumulated. Cells, tissues and organs are damaged due to this process, resulting in death. On the other hand, the programmed senescence theory states that aging and death result from genes being switched on and off sequentially. In the event of programmed aging, the immune and endocrine systems are likely to regulate the process. As an example, puberty and menopause may act as biological clocks. Specific aging processes may be caused by events in the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. Pituitary glands secrete hormones that stimulate other glands to produce hormones. The pituitary gland secretes a hormone that interferes with body tissue's ability to respond to thyroid hormones on the instruction of a biological clock in the hypothalamus. No isolate has ever been found for this theoretical hormone, referred to by some as the death hormone. Located in the chest, the thymus gland plays a vital role in the body. It reaches its maximum size during adolescence and is barely noticeable by middle age. The immune system protects invading organisms such as bacteria, viruses and parasites. The number 50. In the aging immune system theory, the system's decline may be the most critical event in the aging process as it reduces the body's ability to fight infection, fend off cancer and repair DNA damage. While the study of aging is still in its infancy, it appears to be an energetically growing field. To prevent diseases and disorders associated with old age and extend the active life process, it is necessary to understand the mechanism of aging. A change in the gene itself may also be on the horizon for science. One day we will achieve the technical sophistication of our ancestors, the serpent gods that have solved these perplexing scientific problems. Even so, these loathsome creatures must possess sufficient technology to travel between stars. The ability to travel through space and regenerate themselves would undoubtedly have enabled a race to survive for a long time. A lengthy selection and editing process has eliminated explicit references in the Old Testament to our serpent god ancestors. It has been argued that the scriptures contain allusions that are simply allegories. Bronzed or brazen serpents are mentioned in the Book of Numbers, 
which raises many questions that are never fully addressed by biblical scholars. A skirmish between the tribes of Israel and the king of Arad took place in the Negev in the second year of the Exodus after they had left Mount Sinai and were struggling across the wasteland. In the case of the brazen serpent, the following happened. By the road to the Red Sea, they skirted the land of Edom from Mount Hor. During the journey, the people became restless and spoke against the Lord and Moses. Is there a reason you sent us into the wilderness to die? We have no food or water and hate this miserable food. A serpent seraph was sent among the people by the Lord. There were many Israelites who died after they were bitten by them. Moses was told by the people that they sinned by speaking against the Lord and against him. Intercede with the Lord to remove the serpents from us. Moses interceded on behalf of the people. Moses was then instructed by the Lord to mount a seraph figure on a standard. On a standard, Moses mounted a brazen serpent. When anyone was bitten by a serpent, they would look at the brazen serpent and recover. Those who are bitten will recover if they look at it. According to the scriptures, idolatry is an activity that is clearly forbidden. There are only a few references to seraphs in the Old Testament. Isaiah 14 and 30 refer to the seraph as Me'ufef seraph, or literally flying serpent, and associate it with Philistia and the Negeb, which were traditionally the lands of the descendants of the Nephilim after the deluge. Moses made the bronze serpent at God's command, which was revered in the temple sanctuary until King Hezekiah, angry over idol worship, broke it into pieces in the 8th century BC. There is no doubt that this is the original seraph Moses made about 1450 BC that has survived till today. This demonstrates that serpent god worship was well established among the Israelites during the period of the judges and kings, and that Yahweh at least once identified himself with serpent gods. Biblical translators and commentators have been concerned about the term seraph. The King James Version translates it as fiery serpent, but the modern tendency is to leave the Hebrew word alone. There is no convenient classification or translation for seraph. Canaanites acquired it from their Mesopotamian heritage, which is more likely to be a borrowed word. Mesopotamian roots may well be responsible for the term. Enki, the Sumerian god of healing, was often associated with snake symbols, including a flying or fiery serpent atop a pole worshipped for its healing properties. The snake wrapped around a pole also bears a striking resemblance to the Greek caduceus. Seru is the name given to the serpent in the Gilgamesh epic that steals the magic plant from the hero. Hindu mythology also uses the term, which has Sumerian antecedents. Nagas, the mysterious serpent gods who inhabited India in ancient times, were called sarpas or serpents. The theosophist Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky writes in her study of Hindu religion that the Nagas or Sarpas of India are unquestionably the Jewish seraphim, as they derive from Serapi or Sarpa, meaning serpent. There is a little known ancient religious document that refers cryptically to the gods of the Sumerian pantheon in addition to serpent gods. This Christian hymn probably originates in a Sumerian prayer as it belongs to a group of papyri known as magical papyri of Greek origin dated to the 2nd century AD. The song begins with praise. I invoke you, patriarch of the patriarchs, creator of all, creator of the angels and archangels, the creator of the redeeming names. The prayer continues dramatically after several more invocations. Those who sit on Mount Sinai, sit on the sea, sit upon serpent gods, and sit upon the sun god. In ancient Middle Eastern mythology and history, serpent gods are not only found. In mythologies worldwide, dragons, flying serpents, and serpent gods appear, as do man's creators and benevolent ancestors. A cruel and barbaric serpent race is also remembered in some cultures. A faraway land controlled by the goddess Inanna from her tutelary city of Uruk 
is often referred to as a rata in Sumerian literature. A journey to Arata required crossing seven mountains and the dreaded river Kur, as described in the epic Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata. The lost Indus Valley civilization Harappa may be related to Arata. In ancient times, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro were cities of the Dravidians, legendary serpent people who lived in India before the Aryans. Archaeologists made remarkable discoveries in the Indus River Valley during the 1920s. An ancient city called Mahindradaro was excavated on the Indus River proper, and Harappa was excavated on the Ravi, a significant branch of the Indus located in the Punjab. They were also built on alluvial plains, like Mesopotamia and the Nile Valley. Mohenjo-daro and Harappa appear to have been planned thoroughly, unlike these other cities. There was no difference in layout between the two. Each city had a 10-meter high mound, an artificial platform, instead of ziggurats. Within a century, these cities were completed as cities and did not evolve from primitive villages. The buildings were constructed from scratch as if by an outside force. Basically, they were constructed as colonies, probably by the Sumerians and probably by Enki, their chief engineer. According to archaeological evidence, the cities sprang up about 3,500 to 3,000 BC and then collapsed around 2,000 BC. Aryans who settled in the Punjab and Gangetic plains some 500 to 600 years later were not related to those who lived here. Mohenjo-daro and Harappa were also inhabited by people who spoke a language unknown to us. There is also evidence linking this site to the Valley of Mesopotamia, as evidenced by artifacts found here. There are many similarities between the button seals from these sites and the cylinder seals of Sumer. The one depicts a wild man strangling two lions, similar to Gilgamesh standing between them. After the deluge, the world became habitable again, and these cities were established as Sumerian colonies. The Nagas, a serpent man race, lived in these cities and are thought to have been the center of the Dravidian culture. Probably the oldest Sanskrit source, the ancient book of Dzian, speaks of a serpent race that taught humanity from the skies. During her three-year stay in Tibet, Bhutan, and Sikkim, Madame Blavatsky accumulated thousands of Sanskrit sources which were compiled into the book of Dzian. These sources described Nagas or Sapas as semi-divine beings with a human face and a dragon's tail. According to Blavatsky, the Sapa of ancient India had the same etymological roots as the Seraphim of the Old Testament. Hindu mythology and literature are also filled with sexual liaisons between gods and humans and the procreation of numerous strange beings called Dravidians and Dasyus. It is reported that this race lived in large walled cities. Dark-skinned and flat-nosed, they were coarse and cannibalistic. According to the Ramayana, these serpent people were encountered by the Aryans who came later. In Bhagavata, the serpent race hosts live in a broad-wayed, walled and barred city protected by watchful legions. Each serpent youth has a venomed tooth, and Vasuki, who rules them all, lives in his imperial hall. Chapter 3 Sumerians and the Indian Serpent Civilization There had been a complete eradication of Dravidians by the deluge. When the earth was repopulated, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro became the centers of Dravidian culture. Indian epics such as the Mahabharata and Ramayana provide evidence that Dravidians, Dasyus, and Nagas were different names for these people. The two epics describe the early Aryan encounters with serpent people, some of which were friendly and others hostile. Due to the Aryans' intermarried relationships with these people, these two epics seem to have a love-hate relationship. During the wedding feast of the Aryan kings, a group of celestials arrive by aerial car. Winged supanas, scaly nagas, and bright celestial cars sailed upon the cloudless sky, and the gods came in cloud-borne chariots to view the scene. 
Several Naga kings and heroes were produced by intermarrying with Aryans. In the Rig Veda, names such as Divodasa indicate that Dasyus and Aryans crossbred soon after 1500 BC. In Sumer and India, many ancient Hindu gods mated with humans and produced hybrid mammal reptiles known as semi-divine kings. Apes were used in biological experiments by divine people according to Hindu literature. A sacred cake given by Shiva to Anjan, the ape, led to the conception of Hanuman, the monkey god who accompanies Rama in the epic of the Ramayana. Hanuman, the super monkey, appears to be the result of a genetic experiment very reminiscent of Enkidu from the Gilgamesh epic. It is the story of Sita, the bride of a northern prince named Rama, who is kidnapped by Ravana, the serpent king of Ceylon, in the Ramayana, one of the greatest epics of India. Using monkeys under Hanuman's command, Rama chases Ravana's army across India. The island kingdom of Ceylon is supposed to be safe from Ravana's pursuit. An island and mainland are separated by a strait. Hanuman builds a bridge of boulders, and Rama rescues Sita. Ravana wielded sophisticated weapons, like all divine and semi-divine creatures in mythology. It is almost impossible for him to defeat Rama when he uses his special Naga weapon, the Naga dart serpent noose, which paralyzes and drains his enemy's energy and life force. Ravana is described in barbaric terms throughout the story. He feeds on humans and drinks the blood of his foes. Among the Naga's strongholds is Ceylon, the island kingdom of Ravana. In very ancient Chinese sources, the Nagas are described as living here. The first literary reference to Ceylon described it as a strange land of reptilian-like creatures when it traded with China before the Aryan occupation. A convenient location made it a popular entry port for Chinese merchants because of its gems and spices. According to Fa Xian, the Chinese pilgrim trader, Nagas or serpent deities initially occupied the island and merchants from different countries traded with them. Merchants visited and made purchases based on price. Outsiders were never allowed to see the Nagas. Their precious commodities were simply displayed with price labels attached. The Mahabharata, the other great epic of India, is the greatest epic poem in any language. There are 88,000 verses in it, making it much older than the Ramayana. In the story, two branches of the same family are at odds with each other, the Kurus. At the great battle of Kuruksetra, the Pandavas and Kauravas nearly destroy both branches of the family. During a hunt with a bow and arrow, King Pariksit of the Kauravas shot a deer. The aesthetic asks if he has seen the wounded deer while pursuing the deer. As a sage, he did not respond because of a vow of silence. The sage's anger led Pariksit to place a dead snake around his neck. Incensed, Sarunga cursed Pariksit. Two families began a bloody feud as a result. Pariksit is killed by snakes sent by Takasaka, the king of the serpent people. The serpent gods are angry over the blasphemous use of their own kind. Third parties intervene significantly. Blood feuds are portrayed as things that happened in the distant past. Around the upper course of the Ganges, in the 14th and 13th centuries BC, the Kuru's kingdom flourished during the early days of the Aryan invasion. A great sacrifice was made by King Janamijaya at the beginning of the Mahabharata story. As the sage Vyasa, the son of Pariksit, narrates the story, King Janamijaya performs a ceremony to avenge his father's death a snake sacrifice called the Yajna. As a result, it is aimed at destroying the Nagas, serpent gods, who may assume snake form and human forms at will, and one of whom killed Pariksit. Priests invoke the serpent's names as they throw live snakes into a fire during the ritual. Following the serpent king Takasaka's intervention, Janamijaya allows Astika's relatives to live. These long-duration sacrifices were then woven into war stories and other narratives. According to the Indian historian D. Kosambi, the great Yajna sacrifice was the essence of the Yajna 
not a description of a great war. The ceremony was symbolic of honoring their serpent ancestors and simultaneously expelling them from their culture. Mesopotamian wars between the sons of Enlil and Enki are reflected in the struggle for control of the plains of the Upper Ganges between the Kurus and the Aryans. As a result of regaining most of their lost kingdom, the Pandavas appear to have triumphed in the Hindu epic. Both sides used more powerful and sophisticated weapons supplied by the gods as the war escalated, starting with spears, swords, bows and arrows. There are many similarities between these weapons and modern missiles and nuclear systems. One side launches a missile countered by an opposing missile in one instance. They explode as they meet, causing many deaths below ground. Modern connotations are associated with the battle. An anti-ballistic missile armed with nuclear weapons shoots down a ballistic missile, resulting in a deadly rain of radioactive fallout. Kauravas are in desperate straits after a prolonged war. To end the war, they decide to use forbidden tactics. During the night, they attack the Pandavas who are sleeping and slaughter most of their warriors. After violating the rules of warfare and decimating their army, Gaurava uses the celestial weapon, capable of defeating all other weapons. As a result, the Kauravas leader decides to use a similar weapon which apparently produces radioactivity, and declares, I will use this weapon against the Pandava women's wombs. As a result of the weapons producing sterility in all Pandava women, he predicts that the Kuru line will disappear, as the fetus will die. Both branches of the Kuru family are nearly wiped out in the stalemate between the cousins. We are undoubtedly dealing with the winged-legged serpent or Naga of the Hindus, while the serpent god appears as the dragon in Chinese history and mythology. The dragon was chosen as China's national emblem for profound reasons. Due to their belief that the celestial dragon was the father of the first dynasty of divine emperors, the dragon's pictorial emblem became associated with divine beneficence. It is believed that Asian dragons were present at the creation and shared the world with humanity. Dragons taught man how to make fire, weave fishing nets and make music, thus influencing his development. Since the Chinese dragon was unmatched in wisdom and power to confer blessings, it came to represent the most beneficent of men, the emperor, who was believed to have dragon blood. Emperors sat on dragon thrones, rode dragon boats, and even slept in dragon beds to indicate their affinity with dragons. According to Charles Gould's classic work on Chinese mythology, the belief in the existence and friendship of the dragon was deeply ingrained throughout early Chinese history. An ancient Chinese book whose origins are a mystery, the V King, describes a time when man and dragon lived together peacefully and even intermarried, how the dragons came to symbolize the emperor and the throne of China, and how the chief dragon lived in the sky. As a result of Emperor Tsin Shi Huang Ti's order in 212 BC to destroy all ancient books and to persecute learned men for four years, 460 savants were buried alive at one time. <laughs>